Now, there's some stories that are told in different ways, and some stories are true, and some stories are not, as we well know. And I think this is probably Mark Oden and Victor's first time at storytelling. So you know, there's many different kinds of stories. And some kind of stories are the one, the kind of stories that I grew up with are the kinds that cowboys like. And most of the really, really good stories are put together in a song. And so this is, a, this is about the Siree Peaks. Now the Siree Peaks would be like Sierra, La, La Sierras, okay? So, but the English, they say it wrong anyway, Siree Peaks. And so here's the way it goes. Way up high in the Siree Peaks where the yellow jack pines grow tall, Buster Giggs and Sagebrush Sam had a round up way last fall. And the old calf with lop of long ears that didn't bush up by day got his old height sizzled and his long horn chiseled in the most artistic way. Said Buster Giggs to Sagebrush Sam, I'm a throw his long legs down. I'm getting tired of choreography and I reckon I'll jog to town. So they both started out on a right smart lope along by the side of the ride. For those are the days when a good cowpoke could oil up his insides. The old Kentucky bar, they stopped at the end of Whiskey Road, and they wound up tight sometime that night, some 40 drinks below. So the house turned around and set them up, started in the other way. On oh, Mr. Goodness, tell the truth, the boys got stewed that day. They both set out for the Siree Peaks, a packing up a darn good load. When who should they meet but the devil himself just a prancing down the road? Confound you on, Ray Cowboy Skunks, you better have a hunch of old. For I am the devil from the hell rim rock, come to gather up your soul. The devil be darned, says Buster Giggs. We boys both we boys we boys both know we're tight. But before you corral any cowboy soul, you'll sure have a beautiful fight. So he swung his loop and he swung it straight and it spun down good and true. And he looped the devil by his pinted horns and he took his dallies too. Sagebrush Sam was a lariat man with his gut long called out me. He swung it out there and he dug him a hole and he looped the devil's hind feet. So they stretched him out and they laid him down while the sizzling iron drew on. They dehorned him with a dehorn saw and they branded him a lot. They tied ten knots in the old boy's tail and they left him there for a joke. With a beller and coppers they loped right off, left after a blackjack oak. So if you ever go riding in a siree peaks and you hear an awful wail, you'll know it's the devil as he yells and bawls with the knots tied in his tail. <laughs> Bill, you're out. Let's go. Oh, my brain don't work. Oh. We'll give it. I listen to these storytellers and it kind of puts me in a bind, but uh, growing up out here, my mother was the sweetest little angelic creature in the world and we had to be perfect and if we hit each other, I had three brothers older than me and we had to hug and all this stuff. If I said a little ugly word, which I hardly ever did, <laughs> she would take a bar of soap and grind it in my teeth. And all I did was blow a lot of bubbles and say something else ugly, you know, talking about, which I very seldom did, but anyway, I grew up and got my own car and I was driving it to school and uh, it had to be in the Ford place down here with something about a flywheel. I don't know about mechanics. And so I borrowed mother's brand new car. One of them, you ever heard of a Biscayne Chevrolet? That was El Cheapo, big Ford over. And I borrowed it and I went to school down here and I had to sneak off up there and get me a milkshake and a chili bun. And I eased up there and when I drove into this place, now I was raised bar soap in the mouth. Yes ma'am, no ma'am. Strictly, strictly, strictly strict. And so I pulled up to this window. It's just a little creamy. And there's this well-dressed lady up there with her back to me. And all you did was pull in and stop. Didn't have any bumper and things. So I stopped about from here to the wall. And this lady turns around and looks at me real mean. And, and something snapped in me that was not there before. And hasn't been there since but something snapped in me and i thought it would be fun just to i cranked that car back up and i pulled that stick shift down in low and i jumped it out her a couple of times oh, oh. wrong and when i done it i realized this ain't mary's boy and solid boy well, solid wasn't as sweet as mama you know and i'm thinking boy you messed up 
and she walked around to the window and I couldn't stop. Something had got a hold of me. And she said, young man, I happen to be the stenographer of the court. And I said, I don't give a fat rest who you are. <laughs> and that come out of my mouth. And I said, that couldn't have come out of my mouth, but it did. And she walked around back and got a pad out of her purse and wrote something down like the tag number on that new car. And I said, uh-oh. <laughs> Rut row. Now she's going to have me pegged. So the next morning I'm out there waiting for the storm to come and I'm milking two Guernseys. I milked two cows every morning and evening. And they were good cows and we got buckets of milk so Daddy and Mama could give everybody in the church and the community fresh milk. Did the same thing with vegetable gardens. And then I caught all that stuff so I planned everything in the world to give away. And uh, But anyway, Daddy come walking out there to the milk barn that morning and I'm not doing this. And the advantage of doing that you could squirt them cats in the face, kittens, with that milk. Yeah. And they would grab her up and little paws like this, and you could squirt milk in their face, and they would love it. Like that. But then that was the advantage. And the other advantage is the sun never got you hot during the day because you run and jumped on the school bus, and you have a cloud of gnats around you all day for milk, and that cat warm milk on it. And, and another thing is boys didn't mess with you because them old boys would come around and try to push me around a little bit. I'd reach and get them. And you end up with some grip that's gone now, but I used to just get them by the arm and do that. And they didn't bother me no more because I had something in hands. But anyway, <coughs> so I go to town and I go get this creamer and I pull up to this old lady and she writes this stuff down. And the devil got in me for just a while. Next morning I'm out there milking. Daddy comes out and he says, I've got my car out that afternoon. He said, you'll ride with me to town this morning. And I said, yes, sir. Didn't say nothing else. So I got through milking and I took that milk in there and Daddy's standing out by his truck waiting on me. And uh, I went out there and I said, yes, sir. And he said, J.P. Walker, the sheriff, told me to bring you in this morning. And I said, yes, sir. But when I went through the kitchen and set the milk down, Mama gave me a big hug and she said, I'm going to pray for you soon. And I, said, I, said, I, said, I, said, I said, pray real hard, Mama. This might be a fatal mistake I've made. But that was, honest, y'all, it wasn't me that was being ugly. I wasn't geared that way and still not that way. And I don't want nobody around me that's that way. So anyhow, Daddy takes me to the courthouse, somewhere right up here. And, and they just put those glass doors in like a week before. And the judge's quarters, you went through the glass doors on this end, and there was a little hole in the wall door, and that's where the judge kept his stuff. And when we started out of that courthouse, we got in there, and Daddy took me down to J.P. Walker this year. He said, J.P., I brought that boy to you. He said, okay. He said, Bill, I want you to go down front of the courthouse down there and I want you to apologize to that lady. And uh, I said, all you got to do, and then you'll be free. We ain't going to lock you up. And I said, yes, sir, yes, sir. So I went down there and I walked up to that lady with my, symbolically with my hat in my hand. And I said, ma'am, I come down here to apologize to you for what I did the other day. I said, I don't know why I've never done anything that bad in my life, seriously. And I said, I'm so sorry. And she said, well, I know you, son, and I know your mom and daddy, and I know y'all about that kind of people. And I just wanted to help you. And I said, well, you're going to help me, ma'am, for a fact. It's going gonna, it's gonna to straighten me out. I'll never do that again. And she said, well, I'm just so glad that you've taken this this way. I feel like I've accomplished something. And I said, yes, ma'am. And it's not over yet, ma'am. But I knew what Daddy had on his mind, see. So, uh, I walked back up her to the sheriff. And I said, sheriff, I talked to her down there. And we seemed to got everything happy. She seemed to be happy with me. And she thinks she's helped me. And she has, said the sheriff. And he says, Okay, Solly, you can have him back. He said, I'm sure y'all got some plans for each other. <laughs> and Daddy said, yeah, we do, Judge. And so we start out. And they had just put them doors in the week before. And I opened it. I opened, so Daddy went out and the door swung almost shut. And I jumped and grabbed it and pushed it back open. And I saw the judge coming out that little hole in the wall there, his, his quarters. And I grabbed that door and got it back out of the way. And I said, excuse me, sir, I didn't see you. And he says, Daddy's back of Daddy's head, about like that door down there, bottom of them steps. And he said, Solly? Yeah, Judge? Is this your grandson? He said, no, Judge, that's my baby boy. And he said, hold up a minute, I don't want to shake your hand. He said, you've raised a fine young gentleman, and I don't see that in the business I'm in hardly ever. And he said, he said you raised some good boys here. I was, I was number four boy. He said, you raised some good boys here in the community, and I want to shake your hand and congratulate you on raising a fine young gentleman. He didn't know what I really was, see. <laughs> so Daddy shook his hand. They patted each other on the shoulder. And he said, I'm going to run in here and get me 
something to eat before they start the court, you know. And Daddy said, well, you have a great day, Judge. And we started walking out to the truck. Daddy opened that door and I started around. He said, come back around here, bit. I walked back around and I said, he's going to beat me right here in town. <laughs> but look, Daddy says, uh, you see the difference, Bill, in being an idiot, a little punk, somebody that's got no respect. You see the difference in that and being a decent person? And I said, yes, sir, I see it clear as a bell. And he says, okay, I think this is going to be enough for you today. Shock of shocks. And he said, you start towards that high school route yonder and, and make good time right now before I change my mind. I cut out across that street and I went down on the underpass. I was going down on that underpass and I heard that pickup truck coming. Daddy cruised down through there and I had one eye cut that way and I was looking to the side. But I didn't want him to make any mind changes, you know. And so we, I go to the schoolhouse trotting all the way and go in and report, you know, I'm talking about I'm late. Daddy goes home and then I, Next day or two, I did like this. I'd always stick my hands up and say, Daddy, back up a little bit. That's a total submission and humble. And I said, what was you going to do the other day when I, you found out how great I was, nice boy I was? And he said, we're going over to that gravel pit behind the house and spend some time together because your mama couldn't stand seeing what I was going to do to you. <laughs> she couldn't have took it. And I said, yes, sir. i tell you what. I said, that was a wonderful thing God did for me. That was wonderful. And it was, y'all. You know, daddy would have told my room. <laughs> it had been a terrible thing. But, you know, I thought about that all my life. That was just another good thing that happened to old Bill, you know what I'm talking about, and saved me from I don't even want to talk about it. I get scared thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a good boy. <laughs> <laughs> oh. No, I'm, no, I'm, I was getting my phone. You pull oh, wow. up. I'll, do the, I'll be after you. Don't you're going to give me some relief there. I will be, I'll do something in a minute. Okay, folks, I got a question for you. How many of you, when you were children growing up, did something your mama told you not to do, but you got away with it? You never oh. found out well, I guess about it. <laughs> Any of you ever do that? She never found out. Now all of you that's got children and you told them not to do something and they've done it anyway, but you never let them know that you knew about it. Hmm, how about that? Anything there? Yeah. Well, that's the way it goes. You know my son, Jody, he went to veterinary school. He graduated, he come out there a doctor. He is a veterinarian. Well now you don't just come out of school and go to work and make money. You got to do what they call intern work. They assign you to an old vet and then he got to teach you the ropes. Now the thing is my son left out. He drew Lester Spell. You know Lester was a veterinarian until he got tired of working for a living. He went into politics and become commissioner of agriculture. <laughs> and he stayed there because he didn't have to do nothing. He stayed there until he retired out. Now that's where he was. He was assigned to Lester. Now in doing your intern work, you don't learn nothing about doctor and animals. What you learn is how to deal with your customers. For instance, this 90-year-old woman brings her 42-year-old poodle dog in for a liver transplant. <laughs> and the patient makes it fine through the operation and all, but then the patient dies. Now, intern comes in right there. You got to learn how to break the news to this dear lady where she will still pay you that $2,000 vet bill. <laughs> now, that's income. That's what they do. And, and Jody was working with Lester, and they was up at Richmond, Mississippi, just south of Jackson is where they was. Now Pearl River runs through Jackson. South of town, there's a man that got a place out there, Uncle Jim Bowers. Now he owns about four or five hundred acres, it's a farm, and Pearl River borders that farm. And they own that place, that's what they call the high bluff. Now the high bluff standing there looking down at Pearl River, it's a quarter of a mile. That's how fur it is. That's a fur piece. 
that's the high bluff. Now that was the high bluff pasture. Didn't need a fence back there because there ain't nothing going to get out back there. If it does, you ain't going to sell no more no way. So you didn't need a fence. Well, Uncle Jim called out there and said, Lester, my old milk cow had a calf and I believe she's coming down with milk fever. I need you to come out here and give her some IV there and get her up on her feet again. He said, yes, sir, we can get there, but it's going to be dark. Or after, I don't know, we, we so busy, but I will get out there. Where's she at? Oh, she's in the high bluff pasture back there by the old hickory tree. You won't have no trouble of finding her. So it got along about dark. Lester told Jody, said, gather up what we need, and get me a flashlight and some stuff, and we're going to go out there and dock around for Jim's. Okay, okay we're going to do that. So they got out there and sure enough, they found her right where they said. And they gave her the IV and stuff. The calf was fine. The cow got up. She was a doing good. Looked like. Joey said, Doc, where's the high blood? Right over there, about 40 yards. I want to go see it. It's dark. You can't <laughs> see it in the dark. I want to go see the high blood. Jody, you cannot go. If you step off of there, we ain't going to be able to pick you up. You can't go. Doc, I brought this rock, this rock, this big rock. I want to chunk it off the high bluff and see if I can hear it hit the water. Jody, are you crazy? You can't hear nothing for a quarter of a mile if it's that way or that way. <laughs> there ain't no way you can hear it. Doc, I got to chunk a rock. Okay, okay, if you got to chunk, now that flashlight don't quit working like they always do. It is black, dark. He said, now we're going to ease over there and you stay behind me because I don't want you to step off. I know. And they eased over there on that bluff with that rock. He got there. He said, all right, you right on the edge. It's right there. Chunk your rock. He hauled off and slung that rock and they sat there and listened. You hear anything? No. You hear anything? I told you. You can't hear nothing for a quarter of a mile. It don't matter which way it is, that way, that way, or whatever. Let's get out of here. Okay. They turned around to walk off. The doctor fell, tripped over something, and he fell. He hit the ground. Boom. Oh, my goodness, Jody Grant. Doctor, you hurt yourself. My goodness, what in the world? Now, what was that? How come you the ball? I tripped over something. I don't know what it was. Mm -hmm. They felt around there. It was a railroad cross tie. What in the world is a railroad cross tie doing way back here? I don't know. Jody said, Doc, I got an idea. You got an idea. Yeah. Let's chunk this cross tie off here and see if we can hear it hit the water. Have you lost your feeble mind? Look, Doc, you get that in, I get this in, we get up here, we count to three and turn it loose. Look. Come on, Doc, be a sport. My goodness. Let's, I want to see if I can hear this cross till I hit that water. Jody, all right. If that's what it takes to satisfy you, we're going to do it. You get that in, I'll get this in. Now, you ease up here to the edge. We're going to get right on the edge of it. On the count of three, we're chunking this thing. One, two, three. And about the time it disappeared in the dark, there's a big old white goat about that high run right between them and jumped off that bluff. Who did you see that? Man, that's some crazy goat. You know better. Yep. Yeah. Well, let's get out of here. Just forget it. Just forget it. That goat ain't going to be around here no more. I don't know what's wrong with it. Okay, let's go. They went by. They walked out. Uncle Jim, your cow's doing fine. We got her up and everything. By the way, Lester, did you see my goat? Your goat. Yeah, my boy bit it. I had me one imported in $2,000, big white gold like that. <laughs> Doc, I'm afraid I got some bad news for you. What's that? The goat's probably dead. Yeah. What do you mean? <laughs> well, me and Jody were standing there by the high bluff, and this goat run right between us and jumped off the bluff out in the dark and disappeared. What my goat? We can be white goat. What my goat? Well, I don't know. It, 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 might, it might have been, couldn't have been my goat. Impossible. Why you say it's impossible? 
My goat had a chain around his neck about 50 oh. foot long tied on to a railroad pole <laughs> tie. <laughs> Joe Paul. <laughs> I told that up there in Abington, Virginia, and I was into another story, and there was some girl sitting back there. She cackled out, just, I mean, again. And then I started, you ain't supposed to laugh at your own story. <laughs> and then she turned loose. I had to turn around my back and face away from the audience. And I said, I don't know who you are, but I'm taking you home with me. <laughs> always try to remember those members of the guild that have passed away. And I'm going to tell just a little bit of something that um, that I used to do at the beginning of everything that I did. And um, it's a little you do our well be, and then I'll tell you something afterwards. Okay. So the first thing Stale Ron noted at the table was turn Papa Daddy against me. Papa Daddy! He was trying to cut up his meat. I was completely by, taken by surprise. Papa Daddy! Now, Papa Daddy's about a million years old and has got this long, long beard. Papa Daddy, sister says she fails to see why you don't we cut off your beard. So Papa Daddy lays down his knife and fork. Have I heard correctly, sister? You don't understand why I don't cut off my beard? Oh, Papa Daddy, of course I understand. I, I didn't any more than the man in the moon say anything like that. Ha! any more than the man in the moon wants you to cut off your beard. That was the farthest thing from my mind. Still run, no sat there. And made that up while she was eating the rest of the chicken. You did too say it. And nobody in the world could have heard you that had ears. So I just pulled my neck straight back through the napkin ring and left the table. And that's a little bit of you do well. But now Patty, Patty I, used to, I used to do that at the beginning of things kind of as a signature piece. And Hattie Gentry finally said, that you gotta stop telling that Papa Daddy thing, I hate that. So I wanna mention Patty, <laughs> Hattie Gentry, who was one of the founders of this wonderful storytelling guild and event. And other people that have passed. We've had a story that David told a story that was a part of an Al Saucer story. Uh, then we had Laura and Sid, and, and Sid made the wonderful cutting of the Hattie Gentry Award, which I have, and several other people, and we wish we had some more of those so we could give them out again. Um, other, other members, Al, who we had. Uh, can we think of some others? I mentioned to you Ollie Deloach, who sometimes came to the festival. Um, Doc McConnell, of course, was not a member of the that guild, but we loved him. And I think the walking catfish, wasn't that one that you kind of, you and Doc totally yeah. kind of kind of got that one too? Can we think of some other members of our guild and group? Oh, Lucy, Lucy. Lucy, she who was from up, up north in my part of the country, up in Marks, Mississippi. Lucy came to, had been to every single thing in Jonesboro and always came to this blueberry. And she tells the story of the green tail squirrel. And we used to have the green tail squirrel that we would put I out. Know I don't right. know what happened to that. It was over at, it was over at Herbert's and Hattie's and then Hattie's gone. Who else am I missing that, I, that, that has passed away? That is Rocky. A, Rocky. Rocky, okay, okay. Doc oh, yes, Rocky, I well, mentioned Rocky. Rocky, right. Rocky Rockwell um, was from, raised in Hattiesburg, but he lived in Virginia, and he and his, he and his wife always came. 
and uh, Rocky tells some wonderful stories that centered around that. So I just want to say the prophet Isaiah says that it's important to say the person's name. And so I always like to see to it that we have said the names of those that we've loved who've been a part of this storytelling guild, which has been the main storytelling guild in Mississippi. I have one up north that I call St. Peter's Telling, and um, I'm trying to get it hot, working again, doing some things, and I'm doing a special thing I call Winter Lights. So I hope I'll be able to do that. And of course, celebration here in Poplarville continues. So remember those people. That's my story for right now. Anybody else got a story? That's not yeah. a story, but I want to ask y'all why you in this room. I come to a storytelling here in Poplarville. I've heard my grandpa tell stories, and I've never been to a storytelling type situation. And I, all I can remember is a lady come in and very expressive like you are. And she had gotten off a mule outside, and it was sleeping in snow in or something. She come in and backed up to a heater and went to rubbing her hands and rubbing her flanks, warming up, and went into a story and went trip. She turned around and transferred herself, transposed herself or something into this character. And then she went to warming up and she's been riding in the breeze. Would that be Laurel? Would that be Laurel? I don't know, but it drove me crazy. But look, I was hooked just like it, just like I had a trouble hook in my jaw. I was hooked on that storytelling and I started coming and listening and I don't know. But she completely turned herself into this character, and it was uh, something about coming in out of the cold and backing up to the heater. And I went home and I was trying to tell my wife. I said that woman changed herself into this person. Yeah. You know. And it was I think amazing. it might have been Laura. It might have been Laura. Laura. What was her? Evans? Laura, Laura Evans. Evans. Oh. And Laura had. And Laura actually was a novelist. She wrote a really, she really was, good novel. Oh, well, I was hooked. It was over with. I mean, like when I see my little darling wife. Laura's one of our best storytellers, so. and she, we do have wonderful. I, we do have some tapes. I still have several of our tapes, and we might could, uh, that have a story by Al, a story by me, I think a story by Joe. On that tape that we had, this Pop Cruise storytelling stand, do you remember we did that? Um, but I, I should have brought the ones that I have left because I know hardly anybody has a tape recorder quarter anymore, but. Uh, still have those and those those voices are voices that have been resonated for us for a long time. Diane Wheaton because she's still alive. Wanda Johnson I hear from Wanda quite often. Wanda is doing well. Wanda knew I'd been out of work now. Here I am one of the only white women in Mississippi I bet who at Christmas time got a fifty dollar bill in the mail from a black woman, a good friend because she knew I'd been out of work doing the stuff and Wasn't she Wanda said, the one that told the story about coming to Mississippi? This lady is a black lady. She came from Alabama to the storytelling. They had never been in Mississippi to any extent. And so she had someone would come in with her because she was nervous. And in yes, her story, she yes. said, uh, that's okay. You get in the front seat and I'll be in the back seat and you can be driving Miss Daisy. <laughs> <laughs> but she, I loved her stories. And she, isn't she the one that told the story about breaking the Catholic? Yes, yes. yes. She, was a, uh, she had been a, a principal of a Catholic high school and, and uh, she was in education. Wanda, remember Wanda. Um, and Wanda, Wanda has been a, continued to be a storyteller um, through the uh, Alabama Arts Commission. And she wound up leaving Chuchi and going on as a librarian and children. I'll shut up and let David take over. Why don't you write a book about all this? Well, I think Diane has written one. And Di well, she Diane said the, the story, the, the, her book was the Tales of Mississippi People, yeah, Tale. Storytellers. But what, what we were talking about is is history and the names. The history of, I do have a, I did write a really, for the Humanities Council, and it never got published, and I need to pull that book up, I've got it somewhere. But anyway, just just for the record. Us. Anybody the record. that can remember the old um, times needs to be written. My brother just wrote a book uh, called the Little Snake River Odyssey, and it's about my brother, myself, and my sister, and how we all grew up together. I would different different places, but in that book, he has a, a copy of um, a diary, not just not the, just a page, but in. So I gave him my diary from when I don't remember what grade it was in exactly, but it was January something, 
and in the diary it says, Daddy went elk hunting today. Okay, and then the next day, Daddy got an elk. Now, if you look at if you look at those dates in January, you know it was out of season. You know it was the middle of the winter. So there, there's evidence right there that that, that, that proves guilt. <laughs> so I don't know if that was the same incident or not, but Daddy went elk hunting with his brothers and so on, and they got some elk. And they had to go back the next day with a the, with the team of horses and a sled to carry the elk back to the house. And so they put the, they went back and got the elk and put them on the sleigh. It's a hay rack with sled runners under it. And, and, and they brought it back to the house. And right where our house was, it comes off the road, there's a gate that goes back to the barn. And, and so they pulled in by the gate and the horses were standing there with the, the, the team of horses pulling the, the, the sleigh was standing there. And there was the hay rack and there was the elk covered up with hay, see. You can't, I mean, if it's illegal, you better cover it up. <laughs> okay, and so it's co covered up with hay, and and everybody's standing around talking and different things like this, and before long, here comes Bud Hurd. Now, who's Bud Hurd? He's the local game warden. Uh -huh. okay. So he comes driving up. Well, everybody's kind of, kind of nervous, because here's Bud Hurd, and here's these elk right here and everything. And so um, they get to talking about things, and, and, and Dad said, uh, and, and, the, and the elk on that hay rack was making the blood and the, and the meat and everything on that on those elk was making this team of horses kind of nervous. You know, they wouldn't just stand there real quiet. They'd, they'd jerk a little bit, and they kept wanting to go and just couldn't go. And so every time they would every time they would jerk, he said that load of hay would wiggle kind of like jello. <laughs> And, and Dad said, uh, I figured that, that Bud Hurd knew we had elk there, but we weren't going to admit it. In fact, you know, we were all boxers. Francis and Perry and Dad and, 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 and uh, Sink were all boxers. They had a boxing scholarship in high school. And then later on, they did prize fighting. So, and so was Bud Hurd. Hmm. Bud Hurd was one of those great uh, highest fighters that could have, I don't know what he won, but anyway, he used to, he used to fight Francis, to give you an idea. So, Dad said, I guess Bud just figured he's going to have to whip every one of us before he gets out of here if he's going to open his mouth about this hell. And so they were all nervous about whether they're going to have to fight Bud Hurt or not. And finally, finally, the way Dad tells it, finally he just left. Well, Years and years later, Bud Hurd was the was the was the man to fear. You know, if you don't if you're not good on the town of Bud Hurd, we had no other law in Snake River Valley except the game board. We had no sheriff, no policeman, no anybody. Bud Hurd was the law. And years and years later, my cousin Sharon got to meet meet Bud Hurd. She says he's a nice little man. Well, of course, he's a little man because he 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 fought lightweight against Francis. And so he was not a big man to start with. He was just a nice little man. And he said, Sharon said, and, and we got to talking about this incident, and, and, and Buddy got to laughing about it. He says, yes, I, I knew they had help there. And I said, I just stood around just to see how nervous they get. <laughs> <laughs> and, he said, and, and he said, and as I was leaving, he said, uh, you better get that load of hay to the barn before it bleeds to death. <laughs> <laughs> hey! Hey! Whoa! Wow. How are you all? Come right. in! Come in! Come in! Come in! You're busy telling stories. Oh yes, we, we tell are. Stories. We're telling stories. Yeah. Uh, who's next? Oh man. Okay. Well, you know, there are a lot of strange things that happen in the world. Things that no one can explain. And 
sometimes those things that no one can explain are the most spectacular, precious things of all. And that's the way it was for a young minister. He had just taken his first job out of seminary, and this man was a little bit nervous about doing it all right. He wanted to have everything just perfect. And one day, the oldest lady in the congregation calls to make an appointment with him. Okay, what did he do wrong? Because everybody knows she pretty much runs the church because she's been around so long. She knows everybody. She knows everything. She knows where everything is, including where all the bodies are buried. <laughs> but she wants an appointment with him. Now, he's a little bit nervous, kind of like getting called to the principal's office. He makes an appointment, and she comes in. When she goes, she sits down in front of his desk, just as prim and proper as you please. She's got her white shoes and her white gloves and her white hat. And she's all dressed in her Sunday meeting best, even though it's not Sunday. Oh my, he's really in trouble now. She's put on all of her armor because that's like her uniform. Hey, Lord, what did I do wrong? Help me out here. And then she starts talking. Minister, I've been so impressed since you came to our church. You're doing a fine, fine job. And I just wanted to ask a favor of you. Oh, maybe it wasn't so scary after all. Maybe it was going to be okay. Minister, I'm the only one left of my family. Everyone's gone on. I have no one left to count on. So I'm going to have to count on you if you don't mind. Okay. What do you need to count on me for? I'll do whatever I can. Well, I want you to take notes about how I want my funeral. Because there's nobody left to ask to set it out. That's kind of an odd request, but okay. So she goes down the list. She pulls it out of her purse. She's got it all written out. The Bible verses that she wants read, she says, now I want you to make sure and remind them that this world is not the end, that we're going through the other side. And my father's house, there are many mansions, and I've gone on to those mansions. Yes, ma'am, I can do that. Now, I want you to remember to tell them all that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So that they'll all know. That's the way they come. Yes, ma'am, I can do that. And she starts with the music. Now, you know, I've always been very partial to footsteps of Jesus. I would like for you to sing footsteps of Jesus at my funeral. And you can't forget in the garden because that's where I'm going. I'm going to the garden. I'm going to be with Jesus in the garden. Yes, ma'am, we can do that. Not a problem. We've got this. Making notes, writing all his notes of everything she's asking him to do. And then she comes to the very end. She says, and one more thing. After you preach a wonderful sermon about how I've gone home and they can all join me, I want you to do one more thing for me. And she reached in her purse and she pulled out a fork. I want you to make sure that they bury me with this fork. I want you to make sure it's in my hands. In that casket. I want you to make sure of that. Well, ma'am, I'm sorry. That's just the strangest request I've ever had for a funeral. You know, not that I've done a whole lot of them, but when they took us through training and, you know, when I interned and everything had anybody want a fork in their hands for funeral. Wouldn't you rather have your Bible or maybe a flower? No, no, no. No, young man, I want Okay, if that's what you want. Now, here's what I want you to tell people about that fork. I want you to tell them, when you go to a fancy dinner, 
when you sit down at that table and you're served the wonderful food, and then they come and they pick up all the plates, what do they tell you? Keep your fork because dessert's coming. The best is yet to come. <laughs> and I want you to tell them all at my funeral, I've got my fork and I'm ready because I know the best is yet to come. <laughs> and I look forward to seeing them all there gathered around the dessert table. Want me to tell a story? Well, I guess I can tell a story. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is for the for you kids, I guess. It's not really a children's story, but it just tells you what it was like when I was little. I went to a one-room country school. You know what that is? That's a school with one room. The whole school has just one room. How many teachers do you that? Okay. The whole school has one room. And in the school we got grade one, and grade two, and grade three, and grade four, and grade five, grade six, grade seven. What's the last one? Eight. Eight, right. We had all eight grades. In that one room, that one school, one teacher. Now, I can tell you this too. I was always the very best in my class. You know why? I was the only one. <laughs> because there was first grade, there was one person there, second grade, third grade. The only grade that had two persons was my sister and my cousin. Now, if you count all the students in the school, it was David, Kenneth, and Rita. That's me and my siblings. There's Lily and Lexi. That's my two cousins. There's Sharon and Joyce. That's my other two cousins. There's Jean and Shirley and Beverly. That's my other three cousins. So we got all St. Louis's in this one school. There's nobody else but St. Louis's in this school. All eight grades. Who's the teacher? Well, one year we had a teacher, Mr. Pope. Another year we had Miss Beeler. So, but finally, my aunt, Grace St. Louis, was the teacher. She was the teacher all the way through. Till everybody got to be the eighth grade, see? And then, to go to high school, it was too far to go. So everybody that had to go to high school had to move away. Some way or another. But I want to come back to to earlier time because in that one room country school was up on the hill above the temple grade now it was a really good place to have a school for, for kids especially in the winter because in the winter time up on that hill there was these steep slopes and recess if the teacher was really kind to us she let us have a little extra time because then we could slide down the slopes with our sled and other things in recess. But that didn't last too long because they had to move because up on the hill where the schoolhouse was, it was hard to get up the hill sometimes with the ice and the snow. And there was nobody lived up that way. All the people lived down closer. And so they moved the schoolhouse. Jack it up, put some wheels under it, take a Ford tractor and start driving down the road. Guess what? As they were moving the schoolhouse, we got to ride inside the schoolhouse. <laughs> Can you imagine that now? All the kids got to ride inside the schoolhouse as they're moving from up on the temple grade down about a mile from where they sat down. And it, you know what was disappointing? They made us get out to cross the river because the bridge was not wide enough for the schoolhouse. And they had to go around the bridge, across the boulders and everything, and they weren't sure about 
whether or not they could get it up the bank and everything like that. Well, they didn't have any trouble with it. But, you know, we were kind of upset. We had to get out and walk across the bridge and then get back in the schoolhouse after they got across. But that's, that's the true story about moving the schoolhouse. And that's the story about how he, it goes to be in the country, one room country school. If you ever hear a story about one room country school, that was truly it. Well, let me look. Let me look at my book sometimes. You ever dream about flying? Uh, sort of. Did you ever think about what it feels like to fly? Yep. I mean, I, that's one of those things in life. Every once in a while, what, sometimes I feel like I'm falling. And all I got to do is just think about flying. And, and instead of falling, I just kind of soar over everything. Well, that was just in a dream. I actually flew. I know what it feels like to fly, really. Now, building up to that, I gotta give you an idea of what the feeling is like. Part of the feeling is going real fast. If you're going real, real, real fast, you're kind of like flying. But now if you're in a car or you're going fast, but it doesn't feel like flying. If you're on a motorcycle, well, it still doesn't feel like flying, because you're still stuck. But if you want to get on something really fast that feel like flying, get on a pair of skis. Get on a pair of skis going down a slope. Just point them straight off. Let me tell you, you go pretty fast. Now, there's part of this flying part that you've got to remember. Sometimes it doesn't turn out too good at the end when you're flying too fast. Sometimes you get hurt, but there's that feeling of flying. And so part of the times we would, when we were skiing, we would find a jump and do a ski jump. Now, I'm not a ski jumper, and, and I grew up in Steamboat Springs where the world, at one time, the world record ski jump was. 
and I saw these ski jumpers that come off the ski jump and they first like this and then like this and they go way out there and then they land. Well, to me that's too scary. I like to fly but not that much. So one day I really got to fly, just, just like on a ski jump. You know where these the ski jumpers, their body is kind of like a kite. They come to the, to the takeoff and when they start like that, they use their body just like a kite to kind of catch the wind and to carry them out as far as they can. That's the way ski jumpers do it. That's, that's what it feels like to fly. And that's what the feeling is like. And the reason I know is because I felt that feeling. But it turned out not exactly on a ski jump. It turned out at a completely different situation. We were rounding up some cows one day and we were trying to push them over into another pasture in this kind of steep sagebrush land. And this one old cow kept running away from the herd and trying to get back. And, and I mean, she was just ornery, if you want to put it another way. And so she took off and she was going down this hill. My dad says, steeper than a cow's face. And that's pretty steep. <laughs> and she took off down that hill as hard as she could run. And I was on my horse, June, and I figured, I tell you what, I know my horse can outrun that cow. Even if it was straight down the hill. And Joe knows if you're running hard as you can straight down a steep hill, you got to know how to ride. And I could ride too. And he was going to hit every jump and just, and I was getting on her. I guess she stepped in the hole or something. I don't know what happened. But did you ever think about a catapult? You know, they use it in the old days and they take a rock and they sling it like that. And you wind it up real tight and you cut like that. Well, you take it, you take the same machine, okay? And not only you got the catapult going, but you got it going at, at, at 50 miles an hour this way at the same time, see? So you really got an extra boost to that catapult at the time that it goes off. And so when the horse stepped into that hole and did the flip like that, I mean, I was already had the forward motion a long way. And so when it did the flip, and I just went out there and I just sailed, sailed, sailed. And it was a real steep, steep hill, just like the end slope on a ski run. One just wham, he hit the ground. And it was sagebrush this high and this high. And I just skimmed the top of it and just finally came to a soft landing there. That's what it feels like. I know what it feels like. Look back, the horse was okay, everybody's okay. And quite a climb back up the hill to get my horse, but that's what it feels like to fly, and that's how it happened. All right. Yeah. I, I'm ready when I'll ask y'all a question or two. You know me, I got to have information. Uh, do you remember Ben Wood? Yes, I do. Yes, John do. West yeah. from yes, out yes. of Texas. And They're you know some of my we, favorite people. We forgot it was Archie. I didn't mention Archie's name. Who was a member of David. Yeah. 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 John would come over and stay with his daughters in Jackson and then come down to the store town. I do, I remember him. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> what I'm going to tell you is, you know, hard times hit sometimes. Now, over there in Texas, there was a man moved over here, Uncle Joe Denton. He's a retired horse steward from Fort Worth. And I, I was shoeing horses. And he was living on, on Doc Lewis's place down at Picayune. Doc had three pension horses. Now, pension horse, y'all don't understand yet, but I'm gonna give you a definition of a pension horse. That's one that one of your friends went off and paid a lot of money for. Got the horse, found out it wasn't worth nothing. They didn't want to feed it, so they give it to you where you can feed it the rest of its life and you can't get rid of it because it's a gift from a friend. <laughs> now that there is a pension horse. The Doc Lewis had three of them and I'd go down there to show his horses and Uncle Joe he was living in a block house there on the place looking after him and his wife. And like I say, he's from over there in Texas. 
And he'd tell me about stories from back over there and how they would shoot them wild horses off the range and all this stuff. And he said at times, at times, it got real hard over there and about the only food they had to eat was them jackrabbits. And they had to run them down. So them boys, some of them got pretty fast. They could catch, catch a slow jackrabbit. I know y'all eat flapjacks, don't you? Well, they eat flapjacks. That there is a jackrabbit what was hit by 18 wheeler. <laughs> <laughs> That's a flapjack. And they, they eat them things. But now when, when they got all the jackrabbits thinned out, food got scarce. But they was living pretty close to the Brazos River. And that place had some bullfrogs on it. They go down there and get them bullfrogs. And at one time, about the only staple food they had was bullfrog legs. And the first solid food a baby would taste would be one of them bullfrog legs. But now he said you had to be careful about feeding them to them young ones because if you give them to them, you feed them on them too long, they'll hop instead of walk. <laughs> <laughs> and his little brother, his mama fed him on them, them, them bullfrog legs so long and he got so much, so wild, until she'd have to slip up on him to catch him to change his down. <laughs> now he told me about them things and, and what they was doing over there and how them bullfrog legs saved them from starving a lot of times. And he was down there out in Picayune, and he was down there at Thick Pins Hardware and the old uh, Lamar McQueen and, and he was in there and, and a couple more of them boys and they got to talking and, Uncle Joe said, you know, I was sitting outside in the cool and I heard a bullfrog down there on the branch. Shorty Price would come up and he said, you like bullfrog legs? Man, I was raised on them things. I like them too. Little Mark said, you know what? We ought to get together and go frog gigging one night. And they said, let's go tonight. So they went and they come in about midnight with a sack full of bullfrogs. They scat them legs out. Uncle Joe went in there and woke his wife up at midnight, one o'clock. She got up just like a good wife ought to do. <laughs> Come in there and fired the stove up and cooked them bullfrog legs for them men, just like a good wife ought to do. You know, that, that's, that's it. No, no, they had to sit there and eat them frog legs that night, and they had such good luck. They said, we need to do that tomorrow night. And they did. They come in there. Woke Miss Benton up there, and she had a wood stove, had to fire it up, let it get hot and all that stuff. But she got just like a good wife ought to do. She come in there and cooked them frog legs and they eat them. Went on four or five nights, and finally she come in there and she said, you know what? It ain't fair. What ain't fair? Me having all the fun. Said, I, here I am enjoying all of this, and your wife is missing out on it. And your wife, it just ain't fair. And I'll tell you what you do. I want your wife to have fun with this fun. So tomorrow night, you go to your house. And the next night, you go to your house. And then you come back here. I want your wife to have some of the enjoyment of getting up at midnight, firing up a stove, and cooking them our frog legs for y'all. You know what? Them women didn't want to have none of that fun. No way. They wouldn't do it. Frog gigging was over for three or four weeks. And then the, the craving hit them all about the same time. He said, look, we got to have some frog legs. Uncle Joe said, well, come on to the house. We're going to get some more of them frog legs. They went and they come in with a sack full of them. They cleaned them legs up. Now, y'all know, if you, if you know anything about a bullfrog, you cut them legs off and throw him out there, that rest of him's gonna crawl off. He might grow some more legs for all I know. He'll just crawl off down there in the woods. He disappeared. Well, they come in there and they, and they went in there and woke his wife up, missed it, and got up just like a good wife or two. Fired that stove up. They went out there, propped up side the wall of uh, smoking and had them some of that there Dixie 45, you know. That's what made the finest little brewer in the South down there in New Orleans. And they sitting out there while she is cooking them things, she got to thinking. Now when your wife gets to thinking, things is fixing to take place. 
She went out there and gathered up all them heads that was crawling off in the book. Come in there and spread some paper down under the table and dumped them out on the floor. Got them legs good. She said, come on, eat your frog legs. They went in there and sat down. Now she made them pull their shoes off before they come in her house. They didn't come in there with no muddy shoes on. So they was sitting there eating them frog legs and going on with their talking and having a good time. And, and Lamar looked over and he said, did you hear something? Oh, I didn't hear nothing. Then short it a little while. I think I heard something. Uncle Joe I, I didn't hear nothing. No, you know, about that time, Lamar felt something cold touch his stomach. He reared back and looked. And there was one of them front parts of that frog with his feet up on his feet, looking right at him with them eyeballs while he was sucking the meat off that <laughs> He said, what's the matter? Look. At what? He said, look. He looked under there and there was them frog heads crawling out. While they was annoying. Now I'm here to tell you. They didn't express their feelings. But that night. They lost their. Craving. For frog legs. <laughs> now that's the way it happened. Down there. At the door. You to blame. Can't help it, can you? Can't help it, can you? <laughs> Since I have some little ones back here now. Um, earlier today I did one that was a just so story. And I'm going to do a fable that I wrote it's called The Porcupine and the Pig. Once there was, once upon a time there was a little pig who would like to go digging in the dirt looking for sweet roots for his lunch. One afternoon he was down digging in along the forest and his porcupine came in. Now the pig froze because he had heard all sorts of stories about the porcupine. They were about the same size but the porcupine had those really long bristles on it. and when she shook they bristled and made funny noises. So the por pig stood there looking at the porcupine the porcupine looked at the pig and says what's your problem piggy? pig said, well, I don't have a problem. What are you doing here? And the pig said, well, I was fixing to have lunch, but I've lost my appetite. And the pig said, not knowing what else to say, but how'd you do that? Well, hello, looky in the creek. You are a pig, and everyone knows that pigs are pretty stinky. We are not, said the pig. And anyway, everyone knows that porcupines are really prickly. We are not, said the porcupine. And then she hesitated. Well, maybe we are a little prickly, but only when provoked. I mean, if you just pet us in the right direction, there's nothing sticky about us. I mean, and the porcupine look at him. I don't believe you. Well, it's true. Well, I saw that dog when he came back to the farm. The pork said, well, that one had it coming. If he hadn't come after me, I had to do something to stop him. The pig said, that was you? Yes. But he had it coming. The pig thought about it. You know, one day that dog came back to the farm and was chasing me all over the place, and I'd took him right into the pigsty, and he got covered with mud. And when he came out again, he was so muddy that Farmer Brown hosed him off with a really cold hose. The porcupine laughed and said, oh, I would love to have seen that. The pig looked at the porcupine, and they realized they had something in common. And he said, are your quills really not prickly if you pet them in the right direction? The porcupine said, sure, see for yourself. And the pig went over to the porcupine and very carefully sniffed her. 
being careful to go from the nose to the tail. He said, you're right. They're not prickly on this end. As a matter of fact, they're kind of silky. And the porcupine turned to the pig and sniffed him a little bit and said, you're right too. You're not really as smelly as I thought you'd be. And they kind of looked at each other for a little bit and the pig said, you know, I know this great place where there are these terrific sweet roots, and I like to go there for lunch, but I don't go very often and I kind of this really big dog. Oh, but if I went with you, we'd be all right. And the pig laughed and the porcupine laughed and they went off to have lunch together. And what they've learned now is remember that as long as you forget about what everybody says, even a porcupine and a pig can be friends. food that mom puts on our plates that we just can't stand that we like the first thing we do is look for the family dog and kind of like sneak it under the table yeah she's shaking her head she knows what I'm talking about so tell me what is the food that mom puts on your plate that you're just like you like you hide it under your mashed potatoes broccoli you, you don't like broccoli either uh huh. There's always that food. Well, for me, it was always liver. My mom would cook liver, and that whole house would smell like liver. I knew it was coming, and I tried faking a stomachache, pretending I was too sick to eat. Or I'd call my friend and see if I could come eat dinner at her house. I would even look for a dog to feed the liver to, but the problem was we didn't have a dog, so that plan just didn't work. So what was I gonna do? I had to come to the dinner table and try to eat the liver that mom was serving for dinner. Before when I ate broccoli, that was too big, it made me throw up. Yikes, that twice. sounds horrible. But well, I never threw up, okay? But my mom, she was a pretty smart cookie. So it gets kind of hot in New Orleans in the summertime. And out in front of our house, parts of the sidewalk were put together with black tar. And so there were big, long lines of black tar in between the cracks of the sidewalk. My mom sat me down at the table and said, liver makes you strong, gives you big muscles. And I'm like, I don't care. I, I still don't want to eat the liver. She's like, bless you. And she said, I promise you, it's got lots of vitamins in it, lots of iron. It'll give you big muscles. I'm like, I don't know. She's like, try this. Just take one small bite and then start to chew. Swallow it down. Then you know that big, hard, black stuff that's in between the sidewalk cracks? If you go outside after you eat your liver, I'll bet that you will be strong enough to lift it up. And I'm like, no way, because I'd already tried that, but I tried it when it was a little colder outside. And that black tar, it was hard. It didn't move. After all, it was holding the sidewalk together. But I thought I'd give it a try. So I take the bite of liver, chewed it up, made a face, and swallowed it down. Drank a lot of milk after too. And then I went outside. And I reached down, put two hands around that tar, and I pulled, and I pulled, and I pulled, and what do you know? The tar came up off the sidewalk in my hand. And I ran inside and I'm like, look, mom, look, I am strong. The liver did make me strong. Well, my mom was pretty smart. She knew that tar got soft in the heat and that it would be really easy to pull the tar up. But she tricked me into eating my liver. Well, <laughs> I thought that was a pretty smart when I got older. 
And that actually inspired me to write a story about young Charlie. And young Charlie was hungry. He just couldn't wait. What will his dear mother put down on his plate? He lifts up his fork and stops in midair. Oh no, on his plate. What is that sitting there? It's lousy liver! So now I'm going to tell you the story of young Charlie. Dinner is ready, Charlie's mom called. He jumped from the tub and out into the hall. He raced around the corner and flew down the stairs. He did a leapfrog right into his chair. Dinner time, dinner time, what could it be? Hamburgers, pizza with pepperoni? His stomach, it rumbled, it gurgled and growled like a big hungry lion out on the prowl. <laughs> Ta-da! said his mom as she set down his plate. Charlie was ready. He just couldn't wait. He lifted his fork and stopped in midair. Oh no, on his plate. What was that sitting there? There, lurking brownly between potatoes and peas, was lousy liver. Charlie got weak in the knees. Charlie turned green. He felt rather sick. He needed a plan. He needed one quick. If only I could be as small as a mouse, then I could sneak right on out of the house. What a horrible plan. It was simple as that. As soon as he left, he'd be caught by the cat. A dragon, he thought. That's just what I'll be. With fire and wings, no one would dare come near me. Well, that wouldn't work, young Charles scratched his head. As a dragon, he'd never fit into his bed. He could be a giraffe with a long, stretching neck. Giraffes never, ever ate liver, he bet. Oh, well, that simply wouldn't do. As a giraffe, he couldn't tie his own shoe. So, here's an idea, Charlie's mom said. Why don't you just be a Charlie instead? Just take one small bite and then start to chew. And that's exactly what Charlie started to do. It felt kind of funny right there in his mouth as he pushed it around with his tongue all about. He mashed it. He smashed it. He swallowed it down. Liver was really not the worst meat around. And so Charlie said, as he took one more bite, I think I am glad we had liver tonight. Chance to tell, huh? Cynthia, you haven't told one in a no, while. No, I'm not going to. Not going to. <laughs> <laughs> but I need to stack chairs and check restrooms and stuff. Okay, it's it's be it's one o'clock. I guess we're supposed to about finish off. Uh huh. Okay. And yeah, you know, I'll, you know I'll do okay. what you have to do. Okay. Okay. Um, let me see what what's a good thing to end this thing with. A story put in song. We were camped upon the plains at the head of the Cimarron. Along came a stranger, he stopped to argue some. He never said how come it, some trouble with the boss, but he said he'd like to borrow a nice fat saddle horse. Now this tickled all the boys to death, we laughed down in our sleeves. We'll lend you a horse as fresh and flat as you please. Well, Shorty grabbed the lariat, the rope till zebra done, turned him over to the stranger, and waited for the fun. Oh, Dunny was an outlaw who'd grown so awful wild. He could paw the white right out of the moon whenever he got right, riled. Oh, Dunny stood right still, as if he didn't know, until he was saddled and ready for to go. 
When the stranger hit the saddle, old Dunny quit the earth. He traveled right straight up for all that he was worth. A pitching and a squealing and having wide fits with his hind feet perpendicular and his front ones in the ditch. He spurred, we could see the tops of mountains under Dunny ever jump. But the stranger, he was glued there just like a camel's hump. The stranger sat up on him and curled his black mustache just like a summer boarder awaiting for his hash. He thumbed him in the shoulders and he spurred him when he whirled. He showed the flunky punchers that he was the wolf of the world. When the stranger had dismounted, went more upon the ground. We knew he was a thoroughbred and not a gent from town. The boss was standing round the watching at the show. Walked right up to the stranger and said, you needn't go. If you can throw the lasso like your old zebra done, you're the man I've been waiting for since the year one. Oh, uh, first Tuesday every month, we have storytelling, we come up with new stories, we visit a whole bunch of things, we, we mainly need listeners, but we would like to have some, some new storytellers too, because you see, we, we told enough, enough of stories already, we need some new people, and uh, thank you very much for coming to listen to our stories, and uh, and uh, we'll where do you do the storytelling on Tuesday nights? Uh, on the at the Methodist, Methodist, uh, Methodist Fellowship Hall. Hall. Okay. Methodist Fellowship Hall. Up the street, a couple blocks. First Tuesday in every month. Okay. And uh, and then we go do with this this Six thing months. like every year Jubilee, uh, Friday night, and then Saturday like this, and then in the fall it would be just before Thanksgiving. Uh, on a weekend we do it. Uh, a public storytelling, but it will probably be down at the Fellowship Hall in the fall. Oh, but but David, tell them what that fall telling is all about. It's called Celebration. Celebration. Worldwide. Day of Storytelling. It's a day worldwide when all storytellers tell. It's cool. Not just United States. No, all over the world where there, there, I are, mean, there are storytellers in other Yeah, other it's important. I think, so, pro I think they'll probably have storytelling in, in Mali and uh, in Uganda and, 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 and Ethiopia. You think it's all at the same time? Yeah, I think it's around the clock so that it's 24 continuous hours of stories oh, going Oh, that on. could be too, yes. Yeah, they're each doing it in their own time. Though. So they got a bunch of them in the Pacific Ocean telling stories. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What time do you start on Tuesday? Six o'clock. Uh, six o'clock. Six o'clock. Right. Thank you, thank you.